about the just war tradition, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the just war tradition in relationship to the war on terrorism. It's widely recognized that um, in the last decade or so that we've entered a new era of warfare. It used to be that wars were primarily fought between nation states, where you've got clearly defined enemies, clearly defined boundaries, uh, and clearly defined targets. But since 9-11, all this seems to have changed. Terrorism, we've been told, marks the advent of a new kind of war. There's two ways this kind of war is described. Sometimes it's described as asymmetric warfare. And asymmetric warfare is where you have two different kinds of uh, opponents facing each other. Specifically in this situation, it means you have a state actor, like the US or um, its allies, facing a non-state enemy. Enemies who are palpably postmodern in the sense that they are transnational, decentralized, and they move around the world more closely in a way that more closely resembles a fog, or those the mythic beasts with the multiple heads, the uh, hydra, right, where you chop off one head and another head springs up. So that's what a, this new enemy kind of looks like. It's not your traditional nation state for any another nation state which is why it's called, this new kind of warfare is called asymmetric warfare. Another way this new kind of warfare is described is as fourth generation war. Fourth generation war, that means there's at least three other generations, right? The first generation of war is defined as basically lines of soldiers facing each other and shooting each other. The second generation of warfare is uh, more less emphasis on soldiers facing each other and shooting each other, and more emphasis on artillery and massive amounts of firepower. The third generation of warfare emphasized speed and movement, and historically this is the German Blitzkrieg in World War II where they decided instead of massing firepower and just shooting each other, to, to move really quickly to, to the, accomplish the goal. There's a third generation. The fourth generation takes speed and movement, but it also combines it with kind of decentralized, smaller armed forces uh, attacking in small units, and what's called full spectrum war. Full spectrum war means you don't just think about facing the enemy, and the enemy's armies, but you think about the whole population, the whole infrastructure, you think about civilian morale. Uh, some of the theorists of this fourth generation stuff talk about creating conditions that are the psychological equivalent of the bombing of Hiroshima. The bombing of Hiroshima was this tremendous amount of power that physically destroyed an area. Uh, some of the folks who talk about fourth generation warfare say what you want to do is you don't want to create that kind of physical destruction, but what you want to do is um, create the kind of psychological impact that completely shuts down a population's will to fight. So another way this new kind of warfare is described is this fourth generation. In the face of this new kind of war, there's much talk today that the just war tradition is outdated. It's irrelevant. In the face of terrorism, in the face of non-state actors, in the face of this fourth generation kind of war, it's said to have outlived its usefulness. You know, maybe just war worked really well when you had nation states fighting nation states. But it's said when you have nation states now fighting this kind of mythical fog, this hydra beast that fights in this full spectrum, small, moving around, not paying attention, but it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Well, my argument this morning is simply this. I'm going to argue that what is in crisis is a particular kind of just war, a particular way of conceiving and practicing just war, and that the circumstances at the outset of the 21st century, even as they have put one vision of just war into crisis, they have actually opened up possibilities and opportunities for a new and better understanding of just war. Okay? So, the sort of argument in popular uh, discourse in this stuff is that just war is in crisis. I'm arguing that yes, one form of just war is in crisis. And if we actually look at our context, we'll see that our context is actually amenable to a better form of just war. Okay? That's the basic argument. Point. When we talk about just war, we frequently
frequently talk about just war theory. That's how everybody talks about it. Oh, the just war theory, the just war theory. As if just war was a set in stone fixed theory, almost like a mathematical formula or something. Everybody knows the formula. This is what it is. But that's a mistake. There is no just war theory in the sense of a set in stone um, standard account of what just war is that everyone agrees on. Rather, rather, just war is a tradition. It's a tradition. And as such, it is fluid and changing. What just war was under the ancient Romans is not the same as the just war tradition that got absorbed by the likes of Ambrose and Augustine in the early church. And what Ambrose and Augustine said just war was is not the same as what, say, Francis Vittoria said in the end of the Middle Ages. And what Vittoria said the just war was is not the same thing as Hubert Rocius said a century later, and it's not the same as what we talk about just war today. It's a tradition, which means it's growing and it's changing. Alistair McIntyre, one of the great philosophers of our day, says that a tradition is basically an argument extended over time. And that's exactly what just war is. It's not a theory. It's not something that everybody agrees on. Rather, it is an argument extended over time. And so for my purposes this morning, I am going to find two different strands of this tradition. Okay, if it's not a set theory, but a sort of argument over time, I am describing, I'm going to articulate two different strands within this just war tradition. One strand I call just war as a public policy checklist. The other I call just war as Christian discipleship. Just war as a public policy checklist. That's a vision of just war that's at home in nation states and international law. If you want to know what just war looks like, where do you go to look? You look at what nation states do, and you look at international law. And the, this vision of just war is largely a checklist. It's a checklist of rules or criteria that's meant to guide public policy and politicians who guide nation states. You can pull it out on the eve of war. This is just war that we're all familiar with. You know, we don't know anything about just war until what happens. There's rumors of war, and all of a sudden, you look in the newspaper, and there's an editorial that says, all right, is this a just war? And in the, in the space of a few column inches or 500 words, they run through the criteria and help you figure this out. You also see it in church stuff, right? Church uh, leaders will put out statements on just war that produces, you know, that gives you the whole just war tradition in a page or two, and then you just have to figure out, okay, this is the criteria, does it need it, does it need it, does it need it. That's what I call a checklist approach. That's just war as a public policy checklist approach. You can pull it out on the eve of the war, check off the criteria, and off you go. Now, the ethical vision, the way this version of just war thinks about ethics and the way of life is, it's law-centered. It's law-centered. What you do is you learn a list of rules, you memorize them, and then you summon the willpower to follow those rules. That's what I mean by a law-centered. It basically says the moral life is a list of rules, or in this case, just one, is a list of criteria. And what you got to do is memorize those criteria, and then will yourself to follow them. What's interesting in this approach is the character does not matter. The character does not matter. You can be a scoundrel who's never cared about your enemies or it's never cared about your neighbors before in your life. And all of a sudden your neighbor gets attacked and you say, I'm going to go to just war. So you can pull out the checklist, and check off the criteria, and off you go and claim to be a just war. Character doesn't matter. You can be a complete scoundrel, and if you can check off this list, you can claim to be a just war. That's one vision of just war. Other vision of just war is just war is Christian discipleship. It's not rooted in nation states and international law, it's rooted in the church. This vision of just war sees just war as an outgrowth of the Christian community's commitment to follow Christ by loving and seeking justice for our neighbors, even our enemy neighbors, in war. 
and sees just war actually as a form of neighbor love. Now the ethical vision for this account of just war is very different from the ethical vision of the checklist approach. The checklist approach is what? It's the law center, one, right? You just memorize the criteria and then you summon the willpower to follow them. Just war's Christian discipleship is rooted in character and virtue. It understands that the practices that enable one to engage in more justly are actually an expression of the character of the Christian community. It is an extension of the character, of the virtues, of the moral habits and dispositions that mark the Christian community's everyday life. It's an extension of our character as we are in our daily life in peace into the realm of war. Just as we love and seek justice for our neighbors in times of peace, so of course we love and seek justice for our neighbors in times of war. Said a little differently, just war as Christian discipleship recognizes that you are not likely to sustain justice, prudence, honor, courage, both physical courage and moral courage, you're not likely to sustain the virtues and habits of holiness in the moral pressure cooker that is war if you have not learned to embody those virtues before war. Willpower is not sufficient, in other words. War power is not sufficient. If we have not learned to love and serve our neighbors with mercy and justice, if we don't care about our neighbors before war, if we have not learned to treat strangers with dignity and respect when we encounter them in our homes, our neighborhoods, our churches, and jobs, we're not likely to do so in war. See the difference? The public policy checklist approach, this is not a great analogy, but go with me for a second, treats just war almost like a recipe. No preparation. Hey, you want to bake a cake? You fill out the instructions. You follow the instructions. Anyone can bake a cake. I know that's a bit of a simplification, but just go with me. Whereas Just War's Christian discipleship thinks of Just War more along the lines of preparation for an athletic event. Take a soccer match, for example. If you have a soccer team that never practiced, never did anything, but hey, decided let's go into this soccer tournament, and so the night before they got you know a bunch of folks got together pulled out the rule book, let's learn how to play soccer and read the rules, and then showed up the next day to play, that's not a team that would do very well, would it? Must make you were playing a local preschool. <laughs> Just Wars Christian Discipleship says it takes training and habituation into a certain kind of character, into a certain kind of virtues, before you go to war, in order to actually abide by those commitments in the world. It says, in effect, unjust persons cannot wage just war. Just as uh, General Sir John Winthrop once wrote, Winthrop Hackett once wrote, what the bad man cannot be is a good soldier, <coughs> sailor, or airman. Character matters. Scoundrels can't wage just wars, even if they can pull out the checklist. Now, with regard to the criteria themselves, I sort of set up the two traditions in the big picture now. Let's look at the uh, criteria briefly. There are a few differences <coughs> in the way that Just War as Public Policy Checklist looks at the criteria uh, and differences with how Just War's Christian Discipleship looks at it. Put bluntly, the Public Policy Checklist approach is permissive. It's permissive whereas the discipleship vision is much more rigorous and responsible. Now, what does that mean? Let's look at a couple of the criteria. One of the criteria just for is that you have right intent. The public policy checklist approach basically dismisses the whole category of right intent. It says right intent means you've got to say you're for peace, and you've got to say you're not interested in revenge. As long as you say you're for peace, as long as you say you're not about revenge, it's a just war. In, com in com contrast, the just war, as Christian discipleship says, you've got to love your enemies. It's very different. Loving your enemies versus just saying you're for peace. 
And not only is right intent about peace, as the public policy checklist says, but you've got to be for a just peace. Augustine has this wonderful statement. He says, look, every war that's ever been fought is fought for peace. Even the greatest scoundrel who starts a war is really only starting a war so that he can arrive at a peace that better suits his interests. I don't like this peace, so I go to a war to rearrange things for a peace that I like better. So saying you're just for peace isn't enough. You've got to be for a just peace. So it's two very different accounts of intent. Think about last resort. That's another one of the criteria. Just War's public policy checklist in our new circumstances war is very asymmetric war basically dismisses last resort. The tradition says you only go to war as a last resort. And now we're increasingly hearing folks say in a situation terrorism, you don't have to worry about last resort. You can, you can strike whenever it's militarily, strategically advantageous to do so. <laughs> Furthermore, it says, we're going to spend all our time and energy developing better hammers. Y'all heard the saying, uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. Well, that's what this public policy checklist approach says. Just build better and bigger weapons. Compare that with Just Wars Christian Discipleship. Just Wars Christian Discipleship says, if you are serious about war as a last resort, then you've got to devote time and energy to developing means other than war to pursue so that indeed war is in fact the last resort. You do more than develop hammers. Because if all you've got are hammers, that's what you're going to use. That's what you're going to reach for first. But Just War's Christian Discipleship says, no, because we are committed to Just War as a last resort, we will spend time and energy developing alternatives to war that we can pursue prior to picking up our hammer. There's a difference. Uh, a third difference, a really important difference, but what I want to say, is the, the criterion of discrimination. The criterion of discrimination says you can't just kill folks, you can't just kill civilians where we know. That when you target in war, you have to be careful that you do not directly and intentionally target civilians. Now for the public policy checklist approach, they interpret this pretty permissively. And by that I mean they'll say when they're targeting, okay, we're going to target this uh, military installation, that's a legitimate military target, and we know that when we do so, it's gonna kill a bunch of civilians. But we're not intending to kill those civilians, that's collateral damage. We know it's gonna kill the civilians, but it's worth the cost, so you can do it. That's a pretty permissive understanding of discrimination. It basically says it's okay to kill civilians as long as you don't intend it, even if you know they're gonna die, but, and you figure out it's worth the cost. Just Wars Christian Discipleship has a much more responsible account of discrimination. You start to hear this language in uh, political and international circles. Uh, Just Wars Christian Discipleship recognizes a responsibility to protect. Whereas the public policy checklist is permissive, it's okay to kill civilians as long as you didn't intend it and it's worth it. The Just Wars Christian Discipleship says, no, we have a responsibility to exercise care, to avoid, to minimize civilian deaths. Indeed, it goes on to say, it's not enough to say you didn't intend to kill the civilians. If you can foresee that civilians are going to die, then you've got to avoid it. And a great example here comes, comes from the great medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas. There's a treatise on evil, um, and he talks about this it problem uh, in, in the context of a woodcutter. He says, you've got a woodcutter who's out in the woods cutting wood. Don't get me to say that real fast. How much wood could a woodcutter cut? <laughs> You've got a woodcutter who's out in the woods cutting wood. Now, if he's cutting wood in a place where people usually say hike or walk, if he's cutting wood in a place where people are known to hike and walk, and he chops down a tree and it falls and kills somebody, he didn't intend that. 
but he shouldn't have done it. And he is morally responsible because it's well known that people walk by here. You can't do that. Now, the permissive account of Justice Warren would say, hey, look, it's fine. You cut down the tree. You didn't intend to kill the civilian. No problem. Justice Warren's Christian discipleship, which says we have a responsibility to protect, says no, you can't do it. Whereas if you're off in the woods where there's not a, there's nobody hiking through there normally, and you chop down a tree, it just kind of blue, somebody happens to be going through and hit them. Well, look, they're not, there's not normally people there. That's genuinely an accident and not morally responsible. Okay. And then the last difference between the two traditions I'll mention before we move on to look at the, the just war and uh, the terrorism dimension is proportionality. Proportionality is a criterion that says the force that you use in war has to be directed at the just end of a war. Okay, I'm in a war with my enemy, and hey, you know, I'd really like to test out this new weapon. That's not a legitimate use of force. You can only use force that's directed towards the just end of war. Or, hey, I really want to weaken this person so in the future they can't compete with me economically, so I'm going to blow up a whole bunch of factories? That's not a just use of force. <coughs> That's a disproportionate use of force. Force is only supposed to be used to accomplish the just end of a war. Well, the difference between these two different readings of tradition is this. Again, the public policy checklist approach is permissive. It basically says, use the maximum force allowable. Indeed, in our political lexicon, we talk, talk about the uh, wine breaker power doctrine. Use overwhelming force. Use the maximum allowable force. Just for Christian discipleship is much more rigorous and responsible. It says, no, you don't use the maximum force. Instead, you use the minimum necessary. It looks a lot more like law enforcement in this regard. Law enforcement operates under an assumption so sort of use the minimum force necessary to accomplish the job. And just for Christian discipleship being much more responsible, much more rigorous, uses the same notion of force, the limited use of force, much more limited. That's a very brief introduction to most of the criteria. I picked those criteria because they're actually relevant to the discussion about the terrorism, <coughs> which is what we're going to talk about right now. This sets the stage to consider the current crisis. Okay? And again, my argument is just war as a whole is not in crisis. What is in crisis is just war as a public policy checklist. Just war as a public policy checklist is in crisis. How so? <coughs> Just war as a public policy checklist, as I said a couple minutes ago, is based in nations and nation states. It's based in the belief that national sovereignty is really important. You can't just go crossing national boundaries. And that's a problem in the context of terrorism with an enemy that's gone all over the place. So if you have a vision of just war that's tied to nation states and says national boundaries and national sovereignty are really significant, that's in crisis. That's a problem. Second, the public policy checklist says that the only just cause for war is self-defense. It says it's self-defense, which means Things like humanitarian intervention cause a problem. You got disasters going on in Sudan, or Burma, or East Timor. Oh, there's no national interest in that at stake. There was a, was a senator from, famous senator from North Carolina, said a decade ago, "What? We got no interest in that rat hole. Um, you know, no national interests, no self-defense at stake. You can't go there." It's a problem in our new setting where we talk about humanitarian intervention and we can see problems going on around the world that don't directly affect our self-defense. Third, you may have heard, uh, if you think back to the fall and the political campaigns, you started to hear this phrase, we're not going to kill our way out of this. And I started to read this in some of the military literature and some conversations with soldiers. We're not going to kill our way.
way out of this. What does that mean? The current crisis of just war is related to the fact that this public policy checklist approach has focused so much on building bigger and better hammers. We're better and better and better killers. We're more effective killers. We can kill more with less. That's not going to work in this situation. So that vision of just war is in crisis. Because it's thought so much about developing hammers, we're now in a situation where having better hammers is not going to solve the problem. And then the last point here is the backlash to the blowback. It's being increasingly recognized that very permissive rules of engagement, that using bigger and better hammers, just thinking on using overwhelming force, remember we talked about how much force you can use in the public policy checklist approach to use a maximum allowable, that's the Powell Weinberger doctrine of overwhelming force, and now recognizing that in a situation of terrorism or what we're going to call counterinsurgency, that's counterproductive. You may be killing some bad guys, Excuse my friends, but you're pissing off a lot of other people that are making them turn against us. So they're now recognizing that this kind of just war that focuses on overwhelming force is in crisis. We're not going to be able to just hammer everything to fix the problem. Okay? So that's what's in crisis. The vision of just war is focused on overwhelming force tied to the nation state, etc., etc. Where's my little clicker? Current context. Crisis, current context. Counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency. The U.S. is deeply committed to a vision of war that is primarily a matter of the destruction of enemy forces. If we had more time, we could talk about it in our culture, all the ways we think about war. When we think about war, we think about destruction. We think about annihilating enemy forces. Now, this vision of war as fundamentally a matter of destruction of enemy forces comes from Henry Jomny, a French general who served first under Napoleon and then later served under the Russian, the Russian army. Now, his ideas, war is about destruction of enemy forces, get, you know, annihilating enemy forces, massive force. His ideas were taught in US military academies and schools, and they bore bitter and bloody fruit in the total war, but it was the Civil War and the Indian Wars of the late 19th century. Now this vision of war is about destroying your enemy forces, that's what war is fundamentally about, is sometimes attributed, mistakenly attributed, to Karl von Clausewitz. Have you all heard of Clausewitz? Not most of you, he's the one that penned the saying that makes him famous that says war is a continuation of politics by other means. War is a continuation of politics by other means. Now this notion of war is annihilation, the destruction of the enemy forces is by John Nee, but it sometimes gets attributed to Clausewitz. But if we actually look at what Clausewitz said and we think about that phrase, war is the continuation of politics by other means, he, what Clausewitz is actually saying is, War is a more complex thing than just destroying your enemy forces. In fact, Clausewitz lifted up what we call the Trinity. The Trinity. War involves three things. It involves armies, obviously, but it also involves governments, and it involves the population, the people. So for Clausewitz, war involved not just destroying the enemy forces, it involved three things. Armies, population, and governments. <coughs> now, just as a side note, kind of hints where we're going. It's worth noting that in the aftermath of 9-11, a small but significant number of voices around the world in both military and civilian circles have suggested that the world has not actually entered a new kind of war of this whole presentation, we've entered a new kind of war. Instead, what folks are arguing is, what we have experienced in the last decade is a wake-up call for a U.S. military and political system that is over-committed to wars of annihilation 
enabled by technology, technologically enhanced massive firepower. The problem, they're saying, isn't that we're suddenly facing a new kind of war. They're saying the problem is that the U.S. is overcommitted to one vision of war, war as annihilation, build more and better technologically enhanced hammers. That's the problem, folks are beginning to say. Not that we've entered a new era of war, but that the U.S. is overcommitted to this notion of war as annihilation. And where does that lead us? Today, in this context of the global war on terror, our context is not destruction of armies and enemy forces, like John Mead thought. Instead, we are in a context of what's called counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency. What is counterinsurgency? Counterinsurgency is a strategy that is grounded in Clausewitz, not John Mead. John Mead says war is about destruction of enemy forces. Clausewitz says no, war is more complex than that. You've got to think about enemy forces, but you also got to think about governments, and you've got to think about populations. Counterinsurgency, and for that reason, is said to be population-centric and not enemy-centric. Wars of annihilation just focus on destroying the enemy. Counterinsurgency says, no, what you focus on is the population and making the population safe. Not destroying the enemy forces. That's not the focus. The focus is winning over the population. So it recognizes, counterinsurgency recognizes that war is part of a larger political structure, struggle. Indeed, it recognizes that military action cannot be the main form of action. This is reflected in the instructions given by a commander in Afghanistan to his troops. He said the conflict is not won or lost by destroying the enemy. That's the old annihilationist vision of war. But by protecting the population. Unlike conventional wars of annihilation, counterinsurgency puts politics, winning the hearts and minds of the population, at center stage. Now, in this setting, as I've already said, just war as public policy checklist is in trouble because it thinks of war largely in terms of destroying enemy forces. It's in crisis. But, but just war as Christian discipleship, this more responsible, this more rigorous vision of just war is actually well suited for this counterinsurgency. That's my last move. Nations should help us love our neighbors, 
But if nations interfere with us loving our neighbors, then we need to still love our neighbors. So national boundaries in the Christian tradition aren't sacrosanct like they are in the sort of public policy check. If we got brothers and sisters, and even if they're not brothers and sisters, if they're just neighbors in Sudan or elsewhere that are suffering, we're called to help. Just because they're in another nation doesn't cause a particular problem for us. Second, just cause. Whereas the public policy checklist approach to just cause says the only just cause for a war is self-defense. Just wars Christian discipleship, we're comp we are other directed. Indeed, the founders of the just war tradition, Christianity Augusta and stuff, said it's not about self-defense. We don't go to war to defend ourselves. He says Christians would rather be killed than kill. This is Augustine, the guy who founded the just war tradition in Christianity. Here he is saying, as Christians, we don't need to defend ourselves. The reason we go to just war is not self-defense. It's to love and serve our neighbors. So just war's Christian discipleship is other-directed. And as such, it doesn't have any particular problems with humanitarian intervention. Whereas the public policy checklist approach says you only go to war for self-defense, and so, yeah, I know people are being slaughtered over there, but you're not going to stay for me. No reason I should go, and they really struggle with it. Right? I mean, you read, you read the book in the, in the Bosnia conflict and stuff, and read stories about women being chained to fences and raped for days until they die. It's bad, but you know, it's not self-defense, so we don't have to go. Just worse Christian discipleship said, we'll call the lover to serve our neighbors. It doesn't matter. There's no self-interest in this. So it's, it, it, it handles better the sort of humanitarian intervention situation. Third, right intent. Remember I said the public policy checklist approach basically dismissed right intent. It's, oh, as long as you say you're for peace, as long as you say I'm not interested in revenge, off you go. But I said the Christian discipleship approach says we're called to love our neighbors and we're called to seek a just peace. Augustine actually says when we go to war, what we're going to war for is we want to bring the benefits of a just peace to our enemy. It would be better for everyone, including our enemy, if they weren't engaged in this injustice. Which means that because of this just war is Christian discipleship, we really care about our enemy. We're called to love them. Augustine says, war does not excuse you from loving your enemies, right? Christian tradition says you're called to love your enemies. War is not an exception to that. It actually fits better this counterinsurgency situation. The counterinsurgency says the goal isn't to destroy the enemy. It's to actually build up and secure the population. Well, that fits with our intent. That's what we want to do when we go to war. We want to build up a just peace. So it's actually better suited for this environment. Fourth point, last resort. Remember, public policy checklist? Just build bigger hammers. Yeah, we're not too worried about spending time and energy on alternatives. Just War's Christian Discipleship wants to develop alternatives to just war. I'm sorry. Wants to develop alternatives to war, more than just hammers. And that, too, is actually better suited to a counterinsurgency environment. Because, right, what do we say about counterinsurgency? It's about, it's population-centric. It's on building up, securing the population. It's about winning hearts and minds, which fits great with last resort. We want to develop all kinds of strategies and tactics and, and practices that will actually build up and secure a population of peace short of war. Indeed, it's been said of counterinsurgency that a physician may be more important than a soldier, that cement may be more important than concertina wire, and civil servants more in demand than infantry. saying in a counterinsurgency context you got to develop all kinds of you got to develop the political dimension not just destroy the enemy forces and that fits really well with just war's Christian discipleship and last resort also discrimination we should be able to you all should be able to fill in the blanks now right the public policy checklist is pretty permissive you can kill civilians so long as you don't intend to and it's worth the cost 
doesn't fit well in an environment where keys to victory are actually protecting civilians. So Just War's Christian Discipleship, which is a more rigorous account of discrimination, responsibility to protect, fits really well with counting insurgency where you want to protect the population. And then lastly, it goes along the same line, proportionality, right? Public policy checklist approach says maximum allowable force. So there's going to be a lot of dead civilians. Just worse Christian discipleship says no, the minimum necessary. And once again, that fits much better with the combat environment where we need to protect the population. <clears throat> Those are the arguments. That is my argument for how one vision of just war is in crisis. This permissive, focused on annihilation, destruction vision of just war is in crisis. It's a good thing, too. It ought to go away. It's not a very good practice of just war. But ironically, as we get this crisis of just war, it actually opens up a space for a much more rigorous, disciplined vision of 